OK, just to remind us where we were, um, objections to Kripke's argument against identity theory. First, we looked at whether there could be species-specific bridge laws. And the answer to that was, well, no, you're still saying that in human beings, C fiber firings are numerically identical to um, pains. Um, but you're not allowing for unusual people who don't have C fibers. Um, and you're not allowing for aliens to have beliefs, etc. Um, the second objection was that the law, oh, it's gone blue all of a sudden. Um, the law of identity doesn't always hold because you can have identity statements like Marianne Talbot is the director of studies at Oxford University's Department of Continuing Education, um, which isn't a necessary identity. And that can't be an objection to Kripke again, because uh, it's only contingent if there are non-rigid de designators flanking the identity sign. And in the case of P pain and C fiber firing, they both appear to be rigid designators, so that's not an objection either. But I did say that um, if you want to question Kripke, any of these three questions would be questions you would want to ask yourself. So I'm going on now to the third objection, which is this. Um, you might want to insist that there are identity statements that appear to be contingent, uh, in other words, possibly false, um, even though they are, in fact, necessary, i.e. necessary truths. Um, for example, it seems to us possible that water is H2O, um, which appears it could have been false. OK, it is, as a matter of fact, necessarily true, because as science has shown that water is numerically identical to H2O, I very carefully went through and made all these subscripts with twos, and it's somehow... <laughs> How very irritating. Um, anyway, that you know what I mean here. Um, so it looks to us as if water is H2O could have been false. Um, but it, it's, even if it looks as if it could have been false, actually it couldn't. As it is true, it's necessarily true. So there's an epistemological contingency. It appears to be the case it could have been false. Um, and what we might ask is, could pain equal C fiber firing appear to be false, even though as a matter of fact, it is necessarily true? In other words, it is an identity. It's a, numerically ident it's a numerical identity, um, but it could still appear to be false in the way that water is H2O appears to be false. OK, are you with me? That's the objection. Here's the response. The identity statement water is H2O appears contingent, i.e. it looks as if it might have been false, because we can imagine being in a situation similar to the one in which we experience water, but where there's no water to experience. So we're in another planet, perhaps, where there's water in lakes and water in showers and water in, um, or sorry, water-like stuff, but it turns out to have a different molecular structure instead of being h2o it's xyz so what we just oh look it's not water this stuff that that seems to be water um well we can imagine that can't we and that's why it looks as if water is h2o could be false but um in order for, for us to use that objection to kripke we'd have to be able to imagine a situation where um we believe we're in pain but we're not in pain okay now just as we could believe we're experiencing water when we're not experiencing water and that's why water is h2o could be false could it be is there any imaginable situation exactly similar to that of being in pain but where we're not in pain and is there a, an imaginable situation exactly similar to that in which we believe P, but where we don't believe P. And I put it to you that most people, and actually th this, most of us would say, well, no, because if you think you're in pain, you are in pain, surely. You can't falsely believe you're in pain, can you? Or can you? Is that psychosomatic pain? Um, well, uh, aren't you in pain when you're in psychosomatic pain? 
pain. There's no tissue damage, but there could be another cause of pain that isn't tissue damage, perhaps. Psychological pain. Mm. It's pain. It's still pain, isn't it? It's the experience of pain. Well, yes, I mean, pain is that which feels awful. Um, I mean, sometimes it feels awful in your tooth, sometimes it feels awful in your head, etc. But, but if you think that there's no uh, imaginable situation where you could think you're in pain but not be in pain, um, there's no gap between appearance and reality in the case of mental states in the way there is with respect to natural kinds like water. Water, it can appear that there's water when there is no water. But it doesn't look as if there could appear to be pain when there is no pain. It's certainly true that there could appear to be pain when there is no tissue damage, which is what psychosomatic pain is. Um, but is that pain or not? Many people would say it still is. <laughs> well, then it doesn't appear you're in pain, does yeah, it? Right. Yeah. No. Uh, you really believe you're, in you're not in pain at all. No, if you really believe you're in pain, then even if that you're not firing off, if your belief in your brain is in pain, then you're in pain. Um, a belief is a mental state, but you said you belief in your brain. Um, do you see how you, in your language you're, you're falling into identity theory, which most people do, so don't worry about that. Um, Okay, um, if you think that there isn't any, if you think that to believe you're in pain is to be in pain, <coughs> then this is no objection to Kripke's argument. So um, I'm going to leave you a question here. Can we imagine situations in which it is with us exactly as if we're in pain, yet we're not in pain? Because if you can imagine such a situation, um, we can diffuse Kripke's argument. That's another way of diffusing Kripke's argument. So here's a summary of the last lecture. Look at that, I've done it in less than 10 minutes. OK, identity theory is extremely attractive um, because there seems to be copious empirical evidence for it in the correlations that science discovers between mental states and physical states. Um, logic tells us, however, that the empirical discovery of a correlation can't be taken as evidence for identity as long as the items said to be identical have different properties. Logic, conceptual analysis, tells us that mental states and physical states do have different properties, uh, and that means it doesn't matter how many correlations between mental and physical states science discovers, none of them can be taken as evidence for an identity between mental states and physical states, unless we can diffuse Kripke's argument. And we've looked at three different uh, ways of diffusing Kripke's argument, and none of them will work, um, although I've left you with several questions um, that you can look at in your own time. Or don't forget, we have a whole um, less, um, lecture five tomorrow is a whole question and answer <coughs> session. So if you stay up all night and find that you can answer one of these questions in the affirmative, then I shall be interested to hear. OK, there's um, all the references that you might want. I've put on the final slide of each um, presentation, so you've got it on the handouts that you've got. So I'm taking it that you agree with me that at least it looks as if identity theory has been blown out of the water. Um, so we've gone back to Cartesian dualism at the moment. If identity theory isn't working, then Cartesian dualism still seems to be in the running. Um, we're particularly unhappy, or you should be, about its being Cartesian dualism, being about two substances. But let's have a look and see if we can come up with a different sort of physicalism, a different way in which the mental can be physical. So in this session, we're going to look at non-reductive physicalisms um, and the problems they face. So we're going to first look at what non-reductive physicalism is, why it's attractive, and then why everyone isn't uh, a non-reductive physicalist. Uh, in other words, there are quite a lot of people who are still, but many people have decided that this isn't a way of being physicalist either. So let's look at why. OK, so first we're going to start with um, what is non-reductive <laughs> physicalism. And we're going to look at two versions. We're going to look at um, functionalism, and then we're going to look at anomalous monism. 
and I'll give you a little test tomorrow on whether you can say that. <laughs> Actually, maybe after dinner tonight, <laughs> see whether I can say it. Um, OK, both versions of non-reductive physicalism reject reductionism. Um, and what that means is that they deny that we will ever find bridge laws. Do you remember I said that the, the reason that identity theory is a reductive theory is it says we'll reduce psychology to physics by finding uh, bridge laws between mental states and physical states. And that's what it is to reduce one theory to another. There are lots of different ways of reducing, but that's the, the simple one. Um, but identity theory has been blown out of the water on the whole. Being a reductive physicalist is not where it's at. So if we're going to be a physicalist at all, we want to find physicalism without bridge laws, physicalism without reduction. And that's what both these theories do. So they deny that mental state types are numerical to uh, sorry are numerically identical to types. So do you remember I had that circle and is a pain is a C fiber firing underneath? That that's what they reject. So functionalism, which we're going to look at first, is the view that mental states are theoretical or functional states. Uh, states that, they, that are the states they are because they play a particular role in a given theory. Now, let's just have a look for a minute at the idea of a theoretical state. Um, whenever you formulate a theory, um, you will usually be postulating something as an explanation of something else. And the something else, the thing that you're trying to explain, is going to be, let's say, observable. And what you postulate in explanation of it may easily be unobservable. So, for example, you notice that your cows get sick um, quite often. There they are, dying on their own four little legs. Um, and you think, why is this? And you postulate, well, it could be that single woman with a cat that I keep seeing walking past this field. She is using magic spells to get at my cows. That's what it is. OK, do you see you've got a theory which explains the sickness in your cows and postulates witchcraft or magic or something like that? OK, um, if you find a better theory, of course, you'll junk your theory of witchcraft and magic, won't you? And you'll stop drowning nice single women with cats <laughs> um, because you'll instead discover that it's actually virus or, or something like that or some bacterium. Um, so a theoretical state is a state like magic, for example, that plays a certain role in theory, in a theory. Um, so nobody can see magic, no one can see witchcraft, but you know what it is because you know the role that it plays within a theory. So God is the ultimate theoretical state or theoretical um, object because you say, well, here's the world. It works like this. The only way we can explain it is by postulating this unobservable who has these properties. Um, therefore, God exists. Um, so again, you've got a theory by which to explain what we see around us and a theoretical object or property um, that does the explaining. So functionalism is the view that that's what a mental state is. It's a theoretical or functional state. It's a state that functions a certain way in a theory. And the theory that generates our ontological, do you remember I used the word ontology before? The, our ontology is our list of what exists. And so our ontological commitment to a mental state is our belief that mental state exists. So the theory that generates our ontological commitment to mental states, according to the functionalist, is the theory so-called folk psychology. It's the everyday theory to which we appeal in explanation of behaviour. So um, I saw David a minute ago. You, it is David, isn't it? Yes, right. Jolly good. Um, walking downstairs. OK, now, was it the case that you were walking downstairs because you wanted a cup of tea and you believed that you could get a cup of tea by walking downstairs? Coffee, actually. 
coffee. <laughs> All right. You see, I got my explanation slightly wrong, but it wasn't bad, actually, was it? I mean, another explanation was it would be that he was sick of listening to me, and he, <laughs> he just, or I had stopped speaking, and he thought he would go. Do you see what I mean? We, we attribute to each other beliefs and desires and intentions and hopes and fears in explanation of behaviour. So um, if Alan um, and I are going hiking in the mountains and we're both going up um, one track and Alan's in front of me and he suddenly stops dead like that. Now, what, what, am I, what might I think? It, there's a lion or a gorilla or a, or a panther or something, exactly, and he's seen it and he doesn't want to be... Do you see? Immediately I start thinking, OK, there's an explanation for this. What is this explanation? The explanation is going to be in terms of beliefs, desires, intentions, hopes, fears, etc., etc. Uh, and, of course, perceptions and sensations and because he's seen the gorilla and he is frightened of it, etc., OK, so that's, that's the theory um, that we postulate an explanation of, of our observable behaviour. And that theory appeals ineliminably to beliefs, desire, to mental states, beliefs, desires, sensations, perceptions, etc. And the functionalist believes that that's why we believe that mental states exist, because they are that which explains our behaviour. And we can't explain our behaviour in any other way. Therefore, they exist. So, oh, I've said all this, I think. No, in our everyday interactions, we attribute mental states to each other all the time on the basis of our observations of behaviour. And we think of the mental states we attribute, for the reasons that I gave earlier, as internal states that are causally implicated in the production of behaviour. So, if I put my glass on the table, you think I'd, I've done that because I believe the table's there. If I put it there... You, think, you still think I believe the table's there, but that my belief is false. OK. Um, oh, look. Sorry, I've discovered how to use these bits on PowerPoint, <laughs> and I can't resist them. OK, black box here. <laughs> You've got the, the environmental stimuli and the um, behavioural output, and we don't know what this is but we do know that it's a belief or a desire. or So this is the mind, if you like, uh, and the mind is populated with things like beliefs, <coughs> desires, etc. Um, but it's a black box. We don't know anything more about it. All we know is that beliefs and desires are explain our behaviour. Um, so pains, for example, are internal states that are caused by tissue damage. We know, or usually caused, I should say, by tissue <coughs> damage. Um, and that cause exclamations and cries of pain and with limb withdrawal. So I, I touch a hot plate, I move my hand pretty damn quick. Um, so <laughs> there's the input. Uh, I can fill this in a little bit. I'm, I'm calling it a pain, and there's the output. I always thought that diagrams were overrated. <laughs> <laughs> And the beliefs that it's raining are internal states that are caused by perceptions of rain, let's say, and that cause umbrella rainings. Look, there's going to be another diagram. Here we go. I think you've got the idea, have you? So for the functionalist, mental states are functional states, and, but importantly, this on its own doesn't make the functionalist a physicalist. And that's because the claim that mental states are functional states are consistent so far with dualism. Um, can anyone tell me why? Why you could still be a dualist, even though you're a functionalist? No? Okay. You're not saying they're the same. Uh, yeah, you're not, you're not saying anything about them. All you're saying is the pain, the only thing we know about pain at this point is that pain plays a certain role in the, the production of our behaviour. Yeah. It could be a, 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 Cartesian, a Cartesian dualist state that plays that role. We're, we're leaving it entirely open at this point what a pain is in its very nature. Um, so functionalism so far is consistent with dualism. But functionalism is physicalist insofar as it insists that only physical states can play 
or they use the term realize uh, the functional role of mental states. So um, if we go back to my diagram of pain, um, this is functionalism, but it's entirely consistent with dualism. But once you say anything that plays this role must be physical, then you are a physicalist, not just a functionalist. Okay, and that's physicalist functionalism at this point. Do you see why functionalism is physicalist and why it needn't be physicalist? Okay. Um, so functionalism is non-reductive um, because it permits multiple realizability. Multiple realizability. Um, so one and the same mental type can be realized by different physical types. So if I draw again that, um, okay, is a pain, okay, that's the relation or the class, and in here are all the token tokens of that type, or, or if you prefer, members of that class. Um, and the functionalist will say each of these um, is a pain because it's playing a certain role in the theory, but this one is a C fibre firing, and this one is a D fibre firing, and this one is a neural state W, um, or whatever. It doesn't matter. We're, we're completely open about the sort of physical state it is, as long as it is a physical state. And incidentally, it might be the same in all human beings. So um, pains are divided into different classes themselves. So these are hum pains in humans, which happen to be all be paid by C fibre firings. These are pains in dogs, which happen to be played by D fibre firings. These are pains in Martians, which happen to be hydraulic systems or whatever, <laughs> um, and, and so on. So as long as it's physical, what type of physical state it is is completely irrelevant to the, to the functionalist. It could be a computer chip. Then. So it could be a computer chip, exactly so. It would have to play the right functional role, um, so the computer would have to convince us that it was displaying pain behaviour. Um, but if it did convince us of that, it would be a pain, exactly, whatever was inside. Have we found a problem with functionalism already? Well, are they, I can see what they're saying about types, but if you had a particular mental state, like the one I'm in now, uh, would they say that that could have been realised by a different physical state from the one I'm in now? Well, that's a very difficult question, because if you're saying, could this token state have been realised by, or could this token state, which is a state of this type, could there have been another token that was realised differently? The answer is yes to that one. No, no, no. Is that an empirical discovery or just what they're no. they just assume, assuming that rather than claiming? They're assuming that, yeah. Well, the, so functionalism, it, it, the only argument it has for the claim that all functional roles of pain are played or realised by physical states is because it, it's physicalist. Um, and, and it has all the reasons that I gave before for thinking that mental states are physical states for wanting to be physicalist. Is it fairly quick? But what you, you said it's what any kind, some kind of physical state, then you've automatically, you're automatically not a dualist. No, exactly. You're, yeah, no. The, no, the minute you say that they must all be physical, you are a physicalist. Um, so functionalist could, could be dualist, but the minute the functionalist says, what's more, all pains are realised by physical states, you are physicalist. Okay. Um, oh, goodness. Right, do you get the idea? <laughs> um, so this is, all of these are pains... Um, and these two are the same physical state, and, and these two are the same... No, they're not, not quite. Those two are, uh, and so on. Um, I think you've got the idea. Um, by such means, by this multiple realisability, um, the functionalist avoids Kripke's argument. Can you see why? Kripke's argument felled only those claims, uh, or, or at least 
it looks as if it fells only those claims that says every type of a physical state is identical to a type of mental state. Um, and once you allow multiple realizability, you're saying actually any mental state could be realized by all sorts of different physical states. So um, it looks as if we avoid Kripke's argument. Is that the same as saying um, token identity? This, uh, that would be saying that, um, not quite, but you could say it's a token identity theory because each uh, mental token is identical to a physical token of some kind. Right, so that would be a token identity theory? It could be a type of, ide of token identity, yeah. So one way of being a non-reductive physicalist is to be a functionalist. Uh, the other way is to be an anomalous monist. Okay. The anomalous monist um, believes that mental states causally interact with physical states. Well, most of us believe that. Um, and that causal interaction depends on law. Talk about that in a minute. Um, the anomalous monist also believes that all causal laws are physical. And if you put these things together, it believes that all mental states must have a physical description. Well, OK. Um, again, the physical description is going to be... Uh, well, no, let me... I'll talk just a bit about this. Um, OK, we believe that, don't we? We, we don't want to quarrel with that one. We think that mental states causally interact with physical states. It certainly appears to be the case. Um, why should we believe that causal interaction depends on law? Well, let's, let's pull apart our concept of causation at the mo for a moment. Let's say that um, A causes B. What would be our evidence for this claim? Okay, so you see um, perception of a correlation between A and B. Yeah? But that is induction though, isn't it? Well, whether it's induction or not, that, that's, that would be our evidence, wouldn't it? We, if we saw a case of um, A without B, that would be evidence against this claim, wouldn't it? So perception of A and not B, that just means not, um, is evidence against A causes B. Um, it might be that it just shows us that only some A's cause B. Do you see that? It, it might be that no A's cause B. I mean, we could say, well, OK, that blows that one. It's obvious A's don't cause B. But probably we wouldn't say that, would we? We'd probably say, well, maybe only some A's cause B. Only, only um, A stars cause B. Um, now, notice that in allowing that as evidence for and evidence against, we're assuming some sort of determinism. Well, actually, let's not use the word determinism. Let's say that um, if A causes B, then A is sufficient for B, aren't we? In other words, that um, if you've got an A, then you will have a B. You don't have an A without a B if A causes B. Okay. Um, in every case. The minute we see an exception, we, we, we lose faith in our causal claim, don't we? we? We think that at the very least it's got to be modified a bit. Um, it can't be A's cause B. If you see an A without a B, it's got to be A stars cause B or, or you know, A's in conjunction with C cause B. Um, but not A's without the conjunction with C. You were talking about other worlds before. I can imagine other worlds with different laws of physics. Well, we're not worrying about other worlds at the moment. We're, ju we're just thinking about this world at the moment. Don't forget, I did say that other worlds could be this world, but different possibilities in this world. It's true that the laws of nature may have been other than, than we take them to be, but we don't want to think about... All we're doing at the moment is asking what cause means. Yeah? OK, we're pulling apart, we're engaging in the conceptual analysis of our concept of cause. So we think that um, you don't get causation unless you get sufficiency, unless you get A, 
you know, A and not B is reason to believe that A doesn't cause B, that it's not the case that A causes B. Um, so this is why you think that causal interaction depends on laws. What we think we're doing in identifying causal relations um, is we're building up a description of the uniformities that nature, by which nature governs the earth. Do you see what I mean? So there are natural uniformities. I mean, this, I'm, I'm running over all sorts of philosophically interesting things in saying this, but we think there are natural uniformities. A is whenever you get an A, you get a B. And we try and describe these natural uniformities um, thus. And so our laws, which are linguistic, are descriptions more or less accurate of the uniformities of nature, of laws that we, we understand nature that are out there independently of us. Um, see what I mean? That's why we might believe that premise, that we think that where there's causal interaction, there's law. Okay, do you accept that? One question, okay. How do you come to this side? See, they seem to use words differently than, the, than we do normally. But only one cause gives one effect, whereas most things seem to be a combination of multiple causes, so that you could get a storm from a number of different causes. Yeah, no. Uh, Sometimes you have one necessary cause, but it seems, and they say, if it's necessary, it's necessary in all possible words, whereas that's very difficult to ask. No, by necessary here, we don't mean logically necessary, i.e. every possible world, because as, as um, John said, um, there might be different laws of nature in different possible worlds. Um, the laws of this world might have been other than they, than they were. So laws are not logically necessary, if they're necessary, they're only naturally necessary, i.e. they're necessary by nature. So a natural uniformity, which is what we're trying to dis describe when we describe a law, is a, a natural correlation, um, not a necessary one. And your bit about the storm, etc., you're absolutely right. We tend to pick out, um, so any event that causes another event, um, this will have all sorts of, it'll only cause, I mean, so the striking of a match will only cause the lighting of the match if there's oxygen around. Um, if there isn't oxygen around, it doesn't matter how often you strike the match, you're not going to get a lit match. Um, so um, the A causes B is only, if you like, ceteris paribus, because there are lots of other conditions that would have to be satisfied. But in, if those conditions are usually satisfied, we don't usually think about them. We don't usually need to add them into the law. And there are some things like storms that, as you say, are always going to be multifactorial. OK, um, let's go down to this one. All causal laws are physical. Um, the person who's um, saying this uh, it's a chap called Davidson, Donald Davidson. And he, what he actually argue is, is, argues is there are no psychophysical laws uh, or no laws um, governing events in virtue of mental properties. Um, OK, let's think about that. Why does he think that? Well, OK, we, we've seen what we've got about causation, haven't we? We've seen that causation seems to imply law and it seems to imply correlation, exceptionless correlation. But let's say that um, Penny. Penny, I'm sorry, I did ask you before. Penny, um, I see Penny crossing the road and on the other side of the road is an ice cream van. And I know Penny's love for ice cream. Uh, and I know that 10 minutes ago she was telling me how much she'd like an ice cream. So I think, ah, OK, Penny is crossing the road because she wants an ice cream and believes that she can buy one from that van over there. Do you see a perfectly straightforward belief desire explanation? Now, do I believe that? Because every time I've seen Penny crossing the road, she, I've explained that she wants an ice cream and she believes that she'll be able to get an ice cream. 
Is that why I say that on this occasion, Penny is crossing the road because she wants an ice cream and she believes she's going to get one? Is it? So, so do I explain every road crossing by Penny by appeal to a desire for an ice cream? And a, I, d I certainly don't, because she'd be a very odd person, <laughs> actually, if every time she wanted an ice cream, she crossed the road. Sometimes she might be on a diet. Sometimes she might have no money. Sometimes she might be in a hurry. Um, sometimes, etc., etc., etc. I mean, actually, it's not on the basis of regularities that I attribute mental states to us. If I look at Alan and I say, I know what he believes, he's a man of a certain age, man of a certain background, therefore why don't you even have to ask him? He's going to get pretty pissed off with me <laughs> if I do that. And the reason is because actually we like to think that our beliefs and desires are, are actually not a function of exactly what we've come from and what we look like and da-da-da-da. -da -da. Regularity um, in the mental world I is actually not... Um, what lies behind our attributions of belief to each other. What I'm actually trying to do, can I finish, Bob? What I'm actually trying to do in attributing these beliefs and desires to, to Penny when I do is make her intelligible. So whereas in uh, uh, thinking about causes, I'm thinking of the principle of the uniformity of nature or of induction, as somebody at the back said, um, I believe nature is uniform I believe that the future is going to be like the past. I believe that there are correlations between causes and effects and so on. And I always attribute causes on that basis. When I'm talking about reasons, what I'm using is the principle of charity. And the principle of charity says to me, what Penny's just done seems c completely crazy. And I don't say, therefore, she must be crazy. What I say is, well, that's interesting. There must be a reason why she's doing it. What is that reason? I say, Penny, why have you just done that? That's mad. Or let's say, what's your name? Anne. Anne tells me she believes P. Well, I believe not P. So I could just say, well, Anne's obviously mad um, and dismiss her. But actually, she might be right, mightn't she? And I might be wrong. So instead, I'm going to say, well, OK, I know Anne's rational. Why does she believe P? What's her reason for believing P? And I try and work out uh, what I can which beliefs I can attribute to Anne that will make the belief that P intelligible. Um, and in doing so, I might discover that actually her reason for believing P is better than my reason for believing not P, and I drop my own belief rather than... So there are two principles. The principle of the uniformity of nature... Um, P-U-N. It was blue, wasn't it, the one you gave me? Uh, principle of the uniformity of nature. Uh, and the principle of charity. Um, and that governs causation and causal explanations... <coughs> And this governs rationality and reason explanations. So uh, a violation of the principle of the uniformity of nature, when I'm thinking of causes, is reason to, to think that my explanation is wrong. And a violation of the principle of charity, the appearance of irrationality, when I'm attributing reasons, is reason to think that I'm wrong again. So completely different constraining principles in the two sorts of explanation. So, so the mental states causally interact with physical states. We all believe that. It doesn't really need explanation. Causal interaction depends on law. Causal explanation and causal interaction, therefore, is governed by the principle of the uniformity of nature. Causal laws are physical because mental states don't obey laws. They obey charity, not laws. They obey logic, not um, correlations, if you like, not um, constant conjunctions. So what Davidson gets from this is 
if you've got mental states causally interacting with physical states in the context of the truth of both of these claims, then mental states must have some physical description. And what that tells us is that every mental state has a physical description. It doesn't tell us what this physical description is, um, it just tells us there must be a physical description. So if you like, there are events that are, here's an event, and it has mental properties and it has physical properties. And in virtue of its physical properties, it obeys causal laws. And in virtue of its mental properties, it makes true reason explanations. And I think I might have a... Um, so, in virtue of the physical description of the state, the state is governed by physical law. And in virtue of its mental description, it can underwrite a reason explanation of behaviour. So, if we go back to uh, Penny's crossing the road, when I said she's crossing the road because she wants an ice cream and she believes that she'll be able to get one, there is inside her uh, physical states, one of which so can be described both as her desire for an ice cream and as some sort of physical state. Um, and in virtue of that physical state, it causes um, another physical state that is the intention to cross the road, okay? Um, which is also a mental description, but there's no law between the desire for an ice cream and an intention to get an ice cream. Okay, so that is reason to believe that, but there's no causal law between those two things. That all got rather complicated. If they're both physical events, if, if, if there's a physical event which is equivalent to her wanting, and there's a, a, a physical event equivalent to her deciding to go across the road, presumably one causes the other according to the laws of physics. So in fact her desire does cause the intention, even though in folk psychology we might not put it that way. Um, it's, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. Davidson believes that reasons are causes, um, but that reasons don't obey causal laws because you get the interaction. Let's see if I can draw this. Um, actually, I had it there, didn't I? Let's see if I can draw it from this one. I mean, is it because I might have designed an ice cream but not going across the road because I decided that... Well, no, because as you have decided to go across the road, it's too late to... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, want to cross road intention to cross road road crossing <laughs> okay just imagine that road crossing over here um, here is uh, neural state um, M and this is neural state W and so on um, this and this are not law governs, not um, lawfully related. Okay, you often get a desire to cross the road without an intention to cross the road. Okay, you know, you, you've got a, you see the ex-boyfriend across the road and you have a yearning to go across, but you think if I do, you know, it's, I'm not going to look very cool, so you don't go. Okay, so there's no law here. Um, neural state M, uh, there is a law here. Um, if you like. That's why that causes that. But the next time you get a desire to cross the road, it's not going to be neural state M. And the next time you get an intention to cross the road, it's not going to be neural state W. Um, so the fact that you get a law there doesn't mean you get a law there. Are you with me? And, and but actually we're going to question this in a minute. Is there a law here well, no, says Davidson, because the desire to cross the road is not always a neural state M. So there's no law here, and there's no law here. The only law is between these two, but that's a physical law. It's between neural state M and neural state W. How can you believe it? What do you mean, how can you believe it? I can believe that exactly the same mental state can be a different physical state every time it comes. Well, the function is different, that's as well. But in that case, what's the point? 
in what way sense are they correlated? So in what's correlated? The, the mental state and the physical state. Why are they the, the mental state and the physical state are not the correlated. Thing. That's exactly what's important here. They're the same event. They are identical. Tokens are yeah. identical. But why does he think that if, if they're different? For the argument that I had up here. Mental states causally interact with physical states. We agreed on that. Causal interaction depends on law. Okay, so when, if that causes that, there must be a law somewhere, okay, and here it is. All causal laws are physical, here it is, uh, but mental states are not lawfully governed. So what you've got to have is um, every mental state has a physical description in virtue of which it instantiates a physical law, but... And the same physical, so the sa one in the same state makes true this causal law on this occasion, and it makes true this reason explanation on this occasion, but on a different occasion, you wouldn't have the link between this and this, and so you wouldn't get that, necessarily. That's why you'd think it. One fairly quick question, I must move on. I'm not sure if I am, of course, I understand it. Well, that's all right, most people don't. <laughs> uh, I feel hungry. I want to satisfy my hunger. Are they cause and effect in both mental states? Um, I feel hungry is a bit... Diff um, I should say now that Davidson actually only thinks of um, beliefs and desires and propositional attitudes as mental states. He doesn't think of qu qualitative states like hunger, pain, etc. as mental at all. Um, so... Um, it wouldn't work if it, if it was talking about pains, etc., because it's much more likely that pains are correlated with C5 or fiery, at least in a species-specific way. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's let's move on. Um, uh, anomalous modism really is very complicated, uh, and the only thing you really need to get. Oh, hang on. Yes. Okay, so in virtue of the physical description of the state, it's governed by a physical law, and in virtue of its mental description, it underwrites reason, explanations of behaviour. And here's where there's quite a useful, I hope, diagram. Here's the event. Okay, under one description, it's a pain, and under another description, it's a neural state, M. I see I've caused it. Um, as a pain, it's a reason to... Pain... I must have been tired. Yeah. It's obviously going to be a belief that um, that that's penny over there, isn't it? So uh, scrub that pain and write belief it's penny, okay? And that's a reason for my waving to a friend, okay? But. Under the description neural state M, it, what it's causing is arm moving. It's not causing waving, is it? Because um, that neural state M would always cause <laughs> arm moving, and not all arm movings are wavings. Some of them, they're cleaning, window cleanings. And some of them, they're not waving but drowning, but some of them are window cleanings or, or something like that. So... Um, anomalous monism is physicalist insofar as it insists that every causally efficacious mental state token has a physical description. Okay, notice it says nothing about state tokens that aren't causally efficacious. Um, but if it causally interacts with physical states, then it must have a physical description. Um, and it's non-reductive because each token of a mental state type might have a different physical description. So exactly like um, uh, functionalism, um, you get multiple realizability. Here you are. So um, is a belief I'm going to put here. Um, could be, in one case, it's a neural state M, neural state N, etc., etc. So you don't get any type identities in the way you must have if it's identity theory itself. Okay, that was... A, oh, there you are. 
again, multiple realizability of the mental by the physical as done by PowerPoint basic shapes. <laughs> One day I'll get even more bells and whistles. Okay, so anomalous realist uh, monism is realist about the mental. It believes that mental properties are real properties, but that can't be reduced to properties of other kinds. Okay, it's not, um, let me compare that. Functionalist is reductionist about mental properties. It thinks that mental properties are real, but it reduces them to functional properties. Are you with me? So do you remember the functionalist said that pain is that state that is caused by tissue damage and that causes avoidance behaviour. So any state that plays that function is a pain. Okay? So a mental state is a functional state, a functional role. Okay? We're reducing pain, mental states to functional states. Um, so it thinks they're real all right, doesn't have any problem with, with adding them onto the ontology, but it says they're real, but they're something slightly different than we thought they were. They're, they're functional states. Whereas the anomalous monism, monist, um, believes that mental states are real, and what's more, they can't be reduced either to physical properties or to functional properties. Okay, so, so anomalous monism is, if you like, more realist about mental states than functionalism is, because it doesn't reduce them to anything at all. Um, it's easy to say why non-reductive physicalism is attractive. Can anyone tell me why? Easy to say. Easy, isn't it? Come on, easy. We're different from animals. We have consciousness. Um. No, that's not the reason, because that was all... Um, I'm not sure what that is a reason for, but, but that's not a reason for the attraction of non-reductive physicalism. Can anyone else? Monism aspect of it? Um, it doesn't need to be a dualist. It, it, you don't need to be a dualist. Yes, that's one of the reasons for non-reductive physicalism being attractive is you don't have to be a dualist. Um, or at least, actually, the anomalous dualist. monism is a dualist about properties but not as the Cartesian dualist was about substances. Um, so you've, you've got a form of dualism back in here, but it's a very different form of dualism from Cartesian dualism because it's a dualism not of substance, but of properties of substances. Um, okay, why, why else? Okay, you don't have to be a dualist, or rather you don't have to be a Cartesian dualist if you can be a functionalist or an anomalous monism. What else do you not have to be? You don't have to be an identity theorist. We all wanted to be identity theorists because we believe that mental states are physical. We all saw why we couldn't be identity theorists, but this allows us to say that mental states are physical without being a reductivist, without being an identity theorist. Way! You know, this is exactly what we want, isn't it? This is fantastic. Um, so we don't have to be du Cartesian dualists, and we don't have to be identity theorists. We can be a functionalist, or we can be an anomalous monism, monist, and there, therefore we can both accept that the mental exists and is real and is causally efficacious, and we can accept that it's physical. What more do we want? Well, <laughs> um, here are some problems for functionalism. According to the functionalist, mental states are functional states, and this means that so long as a thing uh, has inside it a state that is playing the functional role characteristic of a given mental state, that thing enjoys that mental state. Enjoys being a term of art here. Um, so if pain is a state that plays a certain functional role, an internal state that plays a certain functional role, if you have inside you a state that plays that functional role, you are in pain. Can you see that? This is exactly the identity theorist claim again. I if you've got inside you a pain, that's because it's playing that functional role, because the functionalist identifies pains with 
the playing of a certain functional role, not with a physical state, but with the playing of a certain functional role. And there's a big problem with this, and actually John was wandering around by it earlier on. I don't know if you actually got there. Um, can we imagine something that is enjoying um, a given mental state, but that hasn't got inside it a state that's playing the functional role characteristic of that mental state? Oh, I know why I put this there. The answer to that is no. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I put that there so that, to get you thinking, but I hope you're already thinking, but the answer to that is no. But what about this one? Because don't, you, don't forget that if you've got an identity, A is identical to B, in this case A is a mental state and B is a functional state, um, then if you can split these two apart, you've shown that there isn't an identity. See what I mean? So I'm asking you to imagine something that's enjoying a mental state, but that hasn't got inside it a state that's playing the functional role characteristic of that mental state. And the answer is no, you can't imagine that. So that's a strength of functionalism. But what about this one? Can we imagine something that has inside it something that's playing the functional role characteristic of a mental state, but that isn't enjoying that mental state? <laughs> okay, that's where when you said a computer, I thought you were seeing the trouble for physicalism already. The fact is, if we can create a robot um, that is identical to um, Donald, is it? No? I'm sorry, what's your name? John, I'm sorry, another John. Okay. If we could imagine that we create a robot that is exactly like John, looks like John, acts like John, speaks like John, he wakes up in bed next... I assume you're his wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, sorry, what's your name? Pat. He wakes up in bed next to Pat and Pat... Pats him on the shoulder or whatever <laughs> she does in the morning and, you know, she thinks it's obviously John, etc. Now, we have... Is it clear that, that the robot John feels things like we assume that John does? Or do you think there's a gap here? Why do you think there's a gap? It's had no, no formative training. It's had no formative early, early attachment theories or anything like that that it would have affected. Um, that might be reason to think that he doesn't have beliefs. Um, he could still have pain, perhaps. Um, Won't be the same pain. Mm. The robot, no. Well, I mean, we have to ask whether... But we've already agreed that <laughs> different things might have different sorts of pain. But, but can, can you, if you think that it's possible to imagine a robot that behaves exactly like us, but that doesn't feel exactly like us, then you've got a counterexample to functionalism. I would agree with that. I mean, Turing would suggest that if, if you can't tell the difference between there a is human no difference. and a computer, then the computer is showing human uh, characteristics. The Turing, the Turing test would actually pay, play straight into the hands of functionalism because the Turing test says that if you can interact with a computer, um, in exactly the way you would interact with a human being, then the computer is intelligence. But notice that that's the computer, there we're talking about beliefs and desires and things like that. We're, we're really not talking about pains. Um, I mean, Turing never imagined the possibility of a robot. Well, he might have imagined it, but this wasn't what the Turing test was about. The robot who looked exactly like someone, f sounded exactly like them, engaged in pain behaviour, etc. It, it doesn't exclude it, though, however. No, I mean, you might think that if something behaves as if it's in pain, it, it is in pain. If, it, if there's really, you cannot tell the difference between this thing and a thing that's in pain, then, then you might think that it's in pain. Necessary. You'll accept that, would you? I'm okay. Well, we think that's about people. We just said that earlier. We do think that's about people. Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, but then, isn't that because we 
Because of our experience. Because of our own experience. So I experienced Susie's coat as that rather nice red colour, and I assume that you, you at least have some visual experience when you look at it. Probably one rather similar to mine, but I can't be sure of that. But it doesn't matter because you'd call it red as well. Um, but if we had built a computer so we knew that it was nothing like us inside, as it were, would we still think this? Anyway, can, can you see what the problem is? If there's a gap, then we've got a functionalism has a problem. And lots of people um, think there is a gap. Um, OK, we can certainly imagine the former. I said that. The answer is no. OK, but the functionalist... Ugh, let's forget that. I mean, actually, it, it is important, but as we've managed to go over it, if, unless it comes up in questions, I'm going to ignore it. OK, the second question, the robot who's functionally equivalent to you, if you think that he could be functionally equivalent to you and yet not experience the world as you do then functionalism has a problem. The Chinese room is a, a thought experiment that Searle um, put together where... God. It, it goes like this. Here we go. There's this room. And there, there are two windows in this room. Uh, there's the window where um, little people are feeding in um, things with... I can't even do a Chinese character, but... Squiggles and squoggles. Squiggles and squoggles. <laughs> um, the cards with squiggles and squoggles are being fed in here. And inside here is a little hom homunculus, uh, and he has a manual. Okay, the manual says um, when you get a squiggle and squirrel that looks like that, you output uh, I'm in pain. Uh, and when you get a different squiggle and squoggle, one that looks like that, uh, you output... Um, d can you see where I'm getting to? Um, so this, uh, this chap, this little homunculus, gets very, very, very good at this. Really, really good. So good that there's almost no gap between the input and the output. Um, and what um, we're wanting to know is, is he in, when he says he's in pain, is he in pain? Because if not, again, you've got a gap. You've got something inside that is functioning just like... Um, actually, Purcell uses this for understanding rather than pain. So the mental state of understanding. Um, this behavior of whatever this thing is um, looks as if he's understanding he's acting exactly as if he understands Chinese does he understand Chinese again if you think there's a gap there this is a problem for functionalism because functionalism says if it functions like a pain it is a pain if it functions like a belief it is a belief and your job is to say well actually is that true could it function like this and yet not be a pain or not be a belief? And if so, that's, that's an objection to functionalism. OK, so in all these cases, we're supposing this is... Oh, I, I missed one, didn't I? What did I miss? Oh, the population of China. Actually, I hate some of these thought experiments, but people seem to enjoy them, so... This one goes, we issue the population of China. Well, I don't know why it's always China either. So many of them. Because <laughs> there's so many of them. We issue them all with mobile phones, smart ones that can interact and so on. And we, uh, we have a manual that looks exactly like um, it tells us what to feed in in order to get out pain behaviour or understanding or something like that. And we get on our walkie-talkie and we ask the citizens of China to do this, that and the other, and they do it, whatever it is they're all supposed to do. And the output is functionally equivalent to whatever it is, understanding or whatever. Do you see where I'm going? It's not so easy to understand. The, the idea is if you think of each uh, Chinese person as a neuron, and you're getting them all to interact together in such a way that, it that you can say that the 
functional structure is exactly the same. You get that input, you get that output, and that is the input and output that you need to have a mental state, then the population of China would apparently be the mental state. And what you're supposed to think is this is nonsense, couldn't be the case, therefore there's a problem for functionalism. Because if they're truly playing the functional role of a belief, uh, of a pain, say, and they are not in pain, they're not feeling pain, then functionalism is false. But if you replace the population of China with all the neurons in your brain, you are going to say it's a mental state, aren't you? Um, but isn't that because you know that you can feel pain? I'm saying you can't distinguish between the two arguments. Well, yeah. no, but you, we've already established that you don't think there is a gap. Yes, okay. And if you don't think there is a gap, then you won't think there's a gap in the Chinese case either. That's right. yeah. um, Do we know but most other people will probably think there is. Do we know that the Chinese population of China, wired up like this, won't feel pain? No, maybe they will. I mean, if you're a functionalist, you have to assume that they are they actually pain. they won't feel pain they will be the feeling no, of pain in total they will be pain yeah, yeah. Well, I think which is actually it's not even clear that that's and you can't uh, no <laughs> no it is possible something a bit analogous to that with a, a colony of bees or a colony of ants isn't there in that uh, as units they are useless but all together mm. they can be looked upon as a single organism with a, its own rules and personality and so on. And, and that might be one reason for believing that actually if you were to get the, the Chinese population all acting in, in the way required to be the feeling of pain, maybe you would have to say the feeling of pain is there. Against that, of course, we tend to think that this is not the sort of thing that even could feel pain. But then we think that computers are not the sort of thing that even could feel pain. I mean, actually, if you got a, the Turing, if you created a robot and run the analogous um, exper experiments with a robot as with a computer, if you ended up, if you thought, you know, this is the sort of thing I could end up marrying, you know, maybe it really would, you know, maybe you would have to say that this, I believe it, well, I mean, certainly you, you would believe it felt pain, etc., wouldn't you? Um, I mean, it, it's not as simple as I think, I mean, as I've already said, I don't particularly like, I like that <coughs> experiment actually, but I don't like that one. But I think that one's probably the one that hits home hardest because that's the one that's most imaginable, isn't it? And if you think there's a gap there, if you think creating functional equivalence leaves out, or at least leaves a possibility that the mental isn't there, functionalism has a problem. So in all these, have I done this? No, in all these cases, we're supposing that a thing has inside it, the thing in the last case would be China itself, um, something that functions in the way a mental state supposedly functions, but that it's not sufficient for its enjoying a mental state. That's the problem for functionalism. If you think that, if like Christopher, you don't think that, um, then you can still go for functionalism, of course. Oh, let's just ignore that. <laughs> I don't do flowcharts and things. Um, yes, OK, there you are. said that a minute ago. Um, OK, this is a way to get round that. So we looked at functionalism and the arguments for it, and we've just looked at some arguments <laughs> against it. And now I'm just coming back on those arguments against it to say, actually, functionalism isn't necessarily dead. Um, if you can insist that anything that has inside it, something that's playing the functional role of a given mental state, is enjoying that mental state, um, even if it does lack the properties usually believed to be essential to the mental, then functionalism will be OK. And this is the one that, you, that Chris and um, Bill and so on were coming up with. Um, but there's also, if the functionalist could say that any state that causes a state of believing that one is in pain is a pain state, um, 
then what you're saying is that pains don't essentially have to have qualia. Okay, do you remember we said a minute ago that a pain had to have that feeling of being awful? But actually, if I believe I'm in pain, and you think, as you all said you did shortly, a short time ago, that believing you're in pain is sufficient for being in pain, why do I need a state that feels awful? The belief will do it, won't it? Do you see? So I could just get rid of sensations, I can get rid of qualia completely. Because what will do instead is beliefs that I have qualia. False beliefs, as it happens, but... Do you believe that? So, so do I believe that? <laughs> I, d I think it's actually, I think it's very convincing because I do, um, Occam's razor tells us if you can do all the stuff you need qualia for without qualia, why not? So if you're a totally insensate person, um, or um, thing, thing, you're a totally insensate uh, being, um, but you, for some reason, you wanted to experience... Every time I uh, sustain tissue damage... Yeah. No, every time I sustain tissue damage, I believe I'm in pain. Tissue damage causes in me both uh, pain behaviour, so you <coughs> think I'm in pain, and the belief that I'm in pain, so both the th first party evidence is in and the third party evidence is in. What more is there to pain? Um, well, a phantom limb causes me to think that I'm Belief. think that I'm in pain when I'm not in pain. But do you see that I needn't be in pain if I believe I'm in pain? It depends what you think pain is, whether well, pain is a mental state. Well, physical. what pain is, is is what we're discussing in the, in the whole of these sessions. So I'm certainly not going to say what I think pain is but it does this I, I think it's morphine we but know that we can falsely believe well we know that we can falsely believe we've sustained tissue damage so we can if we have false phantom limb we've still got pain because we still it, pain is in the brain it's not in a limb at all. I, no this is a more pertinent thing I think you you have tissue damage you feel dreadful pain you take drug morphine I think and the patients report they can still feel the pain, but they but don't mind hurt. it any longer. Yes. Yes. But it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it's Actually, really I found myself sitting with a dentist. He was saying, does that hurt? And I was thinking, it depends on what you mean by hurt. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about mental pain compared to physical pain? I, I, don't, I, did, I think you can run exactly the same experiments with mental pain as well. Let, let's move on. But I hope you see how that would be an argument to come back on behalf of functionalism against the people who think that there's a gap because of robots and the population of China and da-da-da-da. Uh, oh, God, another one. Uh, do you find them useful? Because if you do, I will talk you through them. You don't. Does that put, put your hand up if you would find these useful? Right, OK. The diagrams. So the, the way I'm defending the functionalist is this. Tissue damage is input. This causes the belief I'm in pain, which is output as both the belief that I'm in pain. Sorry, that's, that's output down here. Uh, sorry. It's output as the owl avoidance behaviour, etc. So the first person evidence that I'm in pain is in, because I believe I'm in pain. And the third person evidence, pain behaviour, is also in. If you think there is no more to pain than that, then actually I think the functionalist has got a very good defence against the robot who doesn't feel anything, even though it behaves in exactly the same way. Um, the robot doesn't believe is okay. Well, that would be the other yeah. question. You you might say that actually even the robot doesn't even have any beliefs. Mm -hmm. In which case, he might be programmed to convince the third person. He would be programmed. I mean, he would have to be, wouldn't yeah. he? But, but yeah. You said in the start that the right. robot was going to be identical. Now you're saying it's different. Uh, no, I'm saying it behaves identically. Ah. 
Um, no, no, I, I, did, I certainly didn't mean it was physically identical. I mean it behaves in exactly the same way. Um, so everything it does, so it says, God, I feel I've got a terrible headache, um, etc. So you believe it's in pain, but the question is, are, is it in pain? Listen, if it doesn't have a mind, it doesn't have free will. If it does have a mind, the question of whether free will uh, has free will arises in the same way it does for us. Yeah. And, and the question is, we're asking, does it have a mind? So we, we certainly can't answer the second question because we don't know the answer to the first yet. OK, let's move on. So on this story, the functionalist is reducing all talk of qualia to talk of beliefs which means that the functionalist story about belief becomes very important. If you reject the functionalist story about belief, then, then the functionalist has a problem. OK, and at this point, we might want to ask whether there really are functional roles that are characteristic of beliefs. So let's look again at the belief it's raining. Um, it may be caused, as I said it was, by the perception of rain, but it can be caused by almost anything else as well. So, um, Pat, you've forgotten this, but about three years ago... No, you haven't forgotten. You've remembered this very... About three years ago, we agreed that if it was raining outside, you would do this to me. Um, OK, so I see Pat come in today, and I see her go looking very meaningfully at me, and I think, ah, oh, God, I wish I'd brought my umbrella, because I now believe it's raining. Do you see? Um, it, it can, I have a reason to believe that it's raining. Pat's doing this has be given me a reason and it's caused me to believe that it's raining. Do you see what I mean? It can be, and also, it may cause umbrella raising, as it does, but I, it might also cause, if I think it's my wedding day, I might start crying. If I think, oh, good, it hasn't rained for ages. You know, this is just what the garden needs. I might start dancing. Um, so actually, this belief can be caused by almost anything. Actually, anything, probably. And it can cause almost anything. Actually, anything, probably. Um, the thing about beliefs is that they're reasons for acting, and reasons are holistic. Almost any belief can be a reason for any other belief, given the right context. So why should we any think that there's any such thing as the functional role of a belief. And if there isn't such a thing as the functional role of a belief, functionalism is, is at the very least in, in difficulties if it claims to be a scientific theory of any kind, um, because we're never going to be able to identify the functional role. If each belief has a different functional role, um, it might still have a functional role. We're not saying functionalism is wrong in principle, but in practice, it's not any theory that's going to do us any good. I, I, just, I would disagree with that, because I think it can still be a correct theory without being a correct scientific theory. Yes, well, that's what I've just said. It, it could be a correct theory without being a correct practical theory. It's, it doesn't enable us to do anything with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. If each belief plays a different functional role, that would still be... Fun functionalism would still be true, but it wouldn't be very practical. There wouldn't be anything we could actually do with it. Well, because if each of your beliefs that, that, that there's an ice cream at Van Over the Road is a different functional role, then I couldn't even generalise from you, never mind from all of us. OK, let's, let's move on to... Um, functionalism faces major problems, but are the problems conclusive? Answer, no. If we can countenance the non-existence of qualia in the way I said earlier, um, that seems to be a point in favour of functionalism. Um, we would also, if we think that mental states could have just um, individual functional roles, that would be another problem, but it would be only a problem in practice, not in principle. Let's look at anomalous modism. We've got just the right time left. The key problem for an anomalous monism is the problem of causal exclusion. The causal exclusion argument points to the fact that the anomalous monism acknowledges that all causally efficacious mental events have physical properties 
in virtue of which they're subsumed by physical laws. Okay, so let's go back to is it this one. So all mental events have physical properties in virtue of which they're subsumed by physical laws. Okay, and what the objector to anomalous monism asks is, well, then why does he think that mental events are causally efficacious? Um, if a hand withdrawal, so let's do a different diagram here. So here's an event, um, let's call it a C fibre firing, um, causes a hand withdrawal. Oh, sorry, it's a C fibre firing and a pain. Okay, two, two different properties. Um, if uh, there's a law that means that as it's a C fibre firing, it causes hand withdrawal, um, then when you say what causes the hand withdrawal, you're going to answer C fibre firing. There's, there's no role that pain plays at all. Um, if C fibre firing and hand withdrawals are correlated by some causal law, as they are here, then unless pains and C fibre firings are related by some bridge law, unless they're identical, unless these two things here are identical, i.e. going back to <laughs> identity theory, pain has no causal role to play in causing the hand withdrawal. So here you've got pain, here you've got... This is actually... I do diagrams and they're not even correct ones because those are the same state, okay, but two different properties. And it's in virtue of that property that there's a causal law linked to hand withdrawal. There's no law at all between this and this. And so we've just, why should we think that pain causes hand withdrawal? Because we don't know what uh, the fibre actually are. I mean, you know, we call it pain, but now you've told us, or you know, we could be told, the science has told us that um, pain's associated with the, the fibre firing. Now we might call it the fibre firing. OK, but, but the thing is, what those who play this particular um, objection say, the only way we can establish that pain causes hand withdrawal in this case is by identifying the pain with the C fibre firing. And so you go right back, in this case, uh, this is the person who puts this objection is a chap called Yeg Won Kim. Um, you go right back to identity theory. Um, though not to uh, generalised identity theory, you go back to species-specific identities, to which, of course, there are all the problems that we looked at earlier. So if the causal exclusion argument is right, then even if the mental is real on anomalous monism, it has no causal role to play. It's epiphenomenal. Um, and because anomalous monism desires... Um, sorry... And this is because it denies the existence of bridge laws. <coughs> I'm just going to say I'm going to lose my voice in a minute. The causal exclusion argument. So we put the objection. There's an objection to the objection, as usual. You can reject the account of causation on which it's based. <coughs> but I can't even think about explaining that right now. Um, so we might have to look at that again tomorrow during the question and answer time. We haven't got time to look at it now. Um, that's what we won't be looking at now. So like functionalism, anomalous monism fi faces serious problems, but again, the question is, are these problems conclusive? Um, again, if we're prepared to countenance the idea that the relata of the causal relation are not properties but events, and that's what I haven't explained to you, um, we can junk um, anomalous monism. But I think that we probably shouldn't be, um, but let's worry about that later. So this is where we are on physicalism just before dinner. Reductive physicalism is scuppered by Kripke, um, unless you want to accept any of the positions that I outlined that might be questions of, against Kripke's argument. Uh, functionalism seems to involve eliminating qualia from our ontology. Sorry, I might be the only person in the room, but I'm not quite sure. 
uh, okay, qualia are the qualities of um, experiential states. So the awful feeling of pain, the experience of blue that you get when you look at these curtains, um, the experience of love. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so functionalism it's seems... Right. What it's like to be, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, seems to involve eliminating qualia. And anomalous monism seems to involve embracing a, an unusual, to say the least, experience of causation or theory of causation. And <coughs> what I'm going to look at after dinner is perhaps physicalism in all its forms is simply wrong. But for all the reasons we looked at earlier, dualism also seems simply wrong. Um, so what do we do now? And after dinner, I'm going to look at a couple of suggestions that would reject both physicalism and dualism and have a completely different way of looking at the mental. Okay, we'll do that after dinner. We've, we've actually got, if anyone wants to ask a question, we have got five minutes. And there are your references. Why, why is, why get the term anomalous moment? Uh, anomalous monism comes from monism, which means that there is only one stuff has two properties, but there's only one stuff. And anomalous comes from the fact that it isn't uh, law-governed. If we don't have quality, do we have any experience in the outside world? If you have no qualia, no. Yeah. But you believe you do. <laughs> isn't that enough? Oh, so this is Descartes' evil demon and <laughs> nothing here exists? Oh, uh, well, no, hang on. You, you might, you believe you have experience and that leaves it open that there is still a world to experience. Okay. I mean, all there is, all you've lost is, I mean, you, you look at me and you see this beautiful, no, hang on. You look at this and you see this, have this beautiful experience of pink, but that's just you believing you're seeing pink. <coughs> you're not actually seeing pink. Can you tell us something about a, a philosopher's zombie or something, where you say, could a person have no qualia? And I could meet them, and I wouldn't know that they had no qualia. Well, you don't know that I've got qualia, do you? You don't know that I'm not a robot. Them. <laughs> no, well, you don't, do I? Do you? Um, and... and as long as you don't know, then, then you can imagine that gap between something that behaves exactly like me but doesn't <coughs> have to experience the world in any way at all. For all you know, I might be that person. If you're all you might be, you might be that person. You might not really experience red at all. You just think you do. Well, you're still having an experience. You're still having an experience. No. Not, not if this I mean, view I'm doing, giving... Even if it's all imaginary, you, you, still, you still like something in having the experience or having No, no there are beliefs that there is something that it's like, it's but like there is the nothing belief. that it's like. But if, I, if I'm believing that I'm having an experience, it must be like something to believe that I'm having that experience. Well, no, because having a belief isn't the sort of thing that has a, a, what it's like to be, does it? Um, what it's like suggests that there is a... Some uh, referential thing that it relates to, if you see what I mean. Well, n not really, because if, if there's something that it's like for me to look at Susie's... Sorry, I'm very glad you wore that. Mm. To look at Susie's jacket, there's something that it's like for me. Or is there? Is it just that I believe that there's something that it's like for me? But there's a whole experience of redness that you must innately have somewhere in order to think that that jacket is... I'm it's suggesting nice. that there isn't any experience of redness. What there is is beliefs. W when jackets reflect night at 600 nanometers, it causes in me a belief that the jacket is red. There aren't any experiences. But that's internal isn't it? You're generating... No, not trigger. necessarily. Isn't, doesn't the unconscious create this kind of picture of the outside world that passes to your conscious self? Yeah, and a picture... And that picture that's his... So, I want. Sorry, I would just want to be a bit creative here. <laughs> this is Susie, in her lovely red jacket. Sorry, the rest of you got red as well. Okay, and that's causing in me. Um, you think that it's causing an experience of red, which is causing in turn a belief that 
I am experiencing red. Okay, so there are two, that's causing that, which is causing that. And I'm suggesting if you just get rid of that, you don't lose anything, do you? What do you lose? Well, if we're to believe it, don't I have some sensation that's telling me that? Whether it's a deception, and I've created Well, no, myself. what? what uh, if I, uh, I may false, I have other false beliefs. Why can't I have a false belief that I'm perceiving red? You think it is, but I'm exactly. saying if the qualia drops out, what's actually missing? Because no I believe I'm experiencing red. I have no basis for belief doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, and you believe I'm experiencing red. Okay, why do you actually need an experience of red? How do you know it's red? Because it's reflecting light. If it were not reflecting light at 600 nanometers, or whatever, I think that's what it is, um, it wouldn't be causing the belief that I'm seeing red. It would be causing a belief that I'm seeing blue or Green or but you only know it's red because you've seen something else which was reflecting like that. And somebody said that's called red. Exactly, whatever that was. Let, let's say it's um, oh look, Tom's wearing a oh and Penny is too. Okay, so here's Tom, and here's Penny, and they're both causing me to have the belief that I'm seeing red. But that's because in each case, they're, what they're wearing is reflecting light at 600 nanometers therefore causing this belief. You want me to say that it's first causing an experience and then a belief, and I'm saying, why don't we just supply Occam's razor here? We can get rid of that. A good example is litmus paper. Yeah. But that's nothing to do with the polio, is it? Seeing the I think it's time to finish now. <laughs> <laughs> the bar's open.